So this is the firewood process we're gonna be talking about today. If you're new to the channel, we are in between two major projects. We just finished up a huge salvage operation where I saved 36,000 pounds worth of Indiana limestone. And there are tons, literal tons of videos on that if you want to check that out. And we're getting ready to start into the framing of the YouTube Yacht Project, which is a boat themed rental cabin that we've been building in our woods with the YouTube revenue. And then we make videos in between bigger projects to help fund the bigger projects. Hopefully that makes sense. Since I've got a day and I got a buddy that I owe a favor and he needs some firewood and we have just the tool for it, I figured that would make a pretty good video. So I hope you tag along with me. Let's jump into it. This is the Halverson 120 wood processor. This is Dirt Perfect's TL240 that he's letting us borrow so we can do a little bit of firewood. And this is the little pile of firewood that we're gonna to try to get cut up today. This is all wood that we've cleared from projects around the property that we drug up here at the time we were doing the clearing. And I put in a pile to split on what is turning out to be an actual rainy day. Let's get this thing hooked up. Let's chuck a couple maintenance things on it and make sure we're good to go. And then we'll get into the number one question people have asked. Why do I feel like this thing is worth it? Because I've got the answer for you. So the first hookup is this pin connector. Now, they have these harnesses for quite a few machines, but if they don't have your machine, and when I say they, by the way, this is from Clint from CNC Equipment. I'll put a link in the description with their phone number, all their information. If you want to know if it works with your machine, or you got any technical questions for it, give them a call. He's got all the answers and they're just easy to talk to. But if they don't have the harness for the machine, which they didn't for the 240, what they do is they send a pin connector, they send this into the harness and you go through with the multimeter and you check the pins. And when you get in on the joystick, you get in here and you hit whatever button you want. So if you want this to do the saw or you want this to do the bed one way or the other, which we'll get into that as we start working, you hit that button it's going to show up on your multimeter, your test light you're using on that pin. You make a note of it. You make that connection on the back side of the pin connector, and then you have the exact setup that you want on your machine. And that's just a one-time deal. Once you get the initial setup, every connection from there on out is just as simple as finding the hole. It sits there somewhere. I'm confident of that. I'm locking her on. And then of course we've got the hydraulics. And there is a relief valve on the bed. So you've got the third connection here. So that when that relief valve kicks in, it's got a place to dump to. There we go. Give that a twist so it doesn't pop off. We should be good to go. It does use bar oil. It's got a reservoir right here. It's actually looking pretty decent. I think we're okay. And it does have some grease fittings, but I got it into the use last time, so it should be ready to go. And then we'll just do the same thing when we're done with it today. And as far as the chain looks, it's still looking pretty good. He did send an extra chain with it in case I need it. Last thing I need to do to set up, I got this little gauge. It's just magnetic, and I stick it on there. Now, if you fellow wanted, you can do whatever you want. You could do a weld mark. Uh, Clint actually made a rig where a chain hangs from it, so it kind of tells you the end. But that way you get consistent firewood with it. I just magnetic it down on there. I kind of eyeball where the saw is at, which is pretty much the end of this warning label. And I measure over to make sure 
what I'm measuring matches the measurement on the magnet. And then when I'm cutting, I can see where the bed's at. So if I stop the end of the log here and then I pull the bed back and I cut it, that should be my 16 inch cut. Now it's been a little bit since I've ran this, so it'll take me a hot minute to get into the rhythm, but once a fellow gets into the rhythm, you can move through pretty quick. I'm just gonna start working and then I'll just voice over the whole reason why so you can listen to it while you see this thing in action. And then we can kind of go into some of the more detailed stuff like the size of the log, the way the bed safety works and things like that. Just for the sake of discussion, it's 918 right now. And what you gotta keep in mind is we time this to see how long this little section of logs takes. I'm getting in and out a lot to move the camera because I gotta get the shots. A while back, I had borrowed a friend's Woodland Mills sawmill. A lot of people suggested I get a sawmill for the primary reason of saving money. So I borrowed it and I used it for actually two months and used it to help with the project. And one of the things I learned is that for where I'm at, the time aspect of the sawmill just wasn't feasible for me. The more I continue to break my consecutive record of most days alive, I've learned that time is something I need to be investing more of. See, I can work as many hours as I want during the week. I can try to earn as much money as I want. But no matter how hard I work, I can't get more time. The only way I can try to get more time is to invest in things that save time. The sawmill was not the answer, especially for me where I live. 30 minutes away is a large hardwood operation. I can literally drive out there. They can load my trailer with 500, 600 board feet of material. The last time I went out there for Cypress was 33 cents a board foot. And in a total time of an hour and a half, I am back home with everything I need. The sawmill just didn't make sense. So a lot of people wonder, well, why do I think a wood processor makes sense for where I live? And it all comes back to that time factor. This saves me a tremendous amount of time. In fact, I always hated wasting the wood and the trees. Normally, whenever we clear in this area, because there's so much acreage of wooded land versus population, the old fashioned supply and demand, it didn't really make sense to split things and try to sell firewood. You'd be lucky to get 60 bucks for a cord and to get 60 bucks for a cord, you're normally gonna have to deliver it around here. So the financial aspect of selling firewood didn't really make sense. And although I hated wasting it, the quickest thing, the most time effective thing for me was to burn it, throw it in big old piles, be done with it whenever we're clearing for projects. Now enters the Halverson 120 wood processor. Now, although I don't use a lot of firewood, like I mentioned, I've got friends that do use wood boilers and those friends have things that I can borrow from time to time. And we've talked about it before. I think it's okay to borrow from friends, but it's not okay to take advantage of them. If you're gonna use the barter system, you gotta have something to offer. And now, since I've got this tool to use for the time being, that I can split firewood quickly and effectively from the ease of a cab, especially on a rainy day like this, well, it just kind of makes sense. That investment in time is what I'm after. I'm hoping that short description kind of sums up and explains everything, all the questions people have had about that. Why I feel like a sawmill isn't worth it, but I do feel like this is worth it. It all comes down to time. It can be very consuming to split firewood. And I get it, some people love to have that firewood splitting weekend where everybody gets together and they bring the coolers and the saws and the little splitters and everybody has a good time. And that's great if you can afford that time. But with me working full time and trying to do all of these projects and then trying to do YouTube as well, it's a very time consuming thing. 
which means I've got to be able to be in the position for me to be able to utilize the resource of this firewood that I can sit there and stack it and it can sit and I can save it. And when I get a literal rainy day, I can come up here and get it knocked out real quick between projects where it doesn't slow me down and I can keep stuff moving. Time. It all comes down to time for me. And I will add on to that. I know some of you will say, yeah, but you're having to borrow a piece of equipment to use it. Keep in mind, the ultimate goal, which we are working towards because we do have a new hydraulic partnership, which we'll talk about in the future, is to get hydraulics onto the Ford 555 backhoe to where we can use this machine on that backhoe. And then I don't have to borrow it anymore. So it's 10.50 right now. We're probably halfway through the pile. I had to go get another battery and a magnetic mount so I could get you up close on the machine. And I got a sack because I was hungry. All right, so take, take 15 minutes off that if you want or include it because you'll probably get a snack if you split firewood. I've got this piece on here because it was in the pile. Not 100% sure how that's gonna work out. But we're gonna find out. And I switched to the four-way wedge. Oh, you can't see it. I switched to the four-way wedge over there. They don't recommend, I've got the six-way and that's what I had on the beginning. They don't recommend the six-way for the 120. The 120 is the base model. I think Matt from Diesel Creek has the 160. Don't quote me on that, but basic math, 160 is bigger than 120. It's more powerful, it's got more features. They've got some where the wedge itself is on a hydraulic cylinder and you can kind of adjust the size of the split from the machine, which is pretty slick. But this one doesn't have enough power for the six-way. Clint brought it down for me to try to see if it does, and it does okay on stuff that splits well, but when you get into some kind of knotty, twisty stuff, it clogs up on that six-way. So I just switched to the four-way, because all this is going to a buddy of mine who runs it for boiler wood, so it doesn't have to be that small. Anyway, you guys wanna ride along, huh? Hold on, let's, let's see what this log does first, and then I'll put you on. I'll also put you in the cab so you can see how the controls work and kind of what my visibility is like. That's a big question we get. Okay, closing the door is a must, I'll say that. I don't know if you can see the size of the machine. We're building up some dust. Okay. So I lift her way up high because it's easier for me to see. I, I don't know if this is going to do what I want it to do or not. The stick hanging off the end down there didn't help me out. This is not a recommended situation, but here we go. sideways get up there thank you all right you guys want to ride along with me in here real quick get you the inside scoop you ready okay let's go can see my gauge right there. We'll, uh, we'll kind of go slow. See how the logs at the end of the bed? I'll back the bed up. Double tap that grapple just to make sure she's locked. Saw. Grapple up. Split. Grapple down to where I can get my log where I want it. Right there. We'll back up. Then we'll tap that grapple to make sure she's holding tight, then we run the saw. Grapple up, split. Now I will show you the safety when we get out there, but people ask if you can cut through the bed. So right now the bed is under the saw. Okay, if I pull trigger, 
nothing. There is a safety out there that doesn't let you cut through the bed. I'll show you here in a second. Now we're cut. It's 11.44. That's not too bad. If my math is correct, stand by. Just under three hours for all that. That's a pretty fair amount. I wish I had a good way to measure it for you for cord space, but let's just give you a big old look. I feel like that's a decent amount of split wood for just under three hours. We've got just a little bit left to do, but it's different and goes in a different pile. And I, I want to show you what we're doing with it. We don't use a tremendous amount of it, we'll just throw a piece or two in with our campfires. Supposedly it helps with bugs, don't really know if that's true, but it definitely smells good. Well, either way, we use it, we like it. As far as this bed goes, remember earlier we were talking about if the bar can come down and hit the bed, the answer is no. There's a safety down here on this end. It's got to make contact with that before the bar will go down. So it will not cut through the bed. Now that's a good thing. The biggest limiter on this base model for the diameter log is actually this grapple. That grapple is only about 15 and a quarter, 15 and a half tall. That's the biggest limiter for the size log you could cut. If a fellow wanted to buy the base model to try to cut a little bit bigger log, you could probably modify that a little bit. The bar itself could probably cut a couple more inches than what it's specced for. I'm not recommending that by means. If you're going to cut bigger trees than what it's specced for, you probably ought to just size up to the next one and get a few more features. The other thing with it, whenever we get curved trees that have that slight curve to them, whenever they lay in the bed, They'll kind of curve out this way, which gets it further away from the bar. So sometimes that can get a little wonky, but overall, it's not too bad. It doesn't have to be a perfectly straight tree. Most of those trees had a little wonk in them, a little whoop de doo whoop de don't and it cut them just fine. This tree here was too big, and it's probably got to kind of eyeball it, 18 inches on the butt, and then it's got that real heavy curve in it. 
We're 14 on that end, so probably somewhere in there it could have started cutting and splitting. And I need to take this over to the house and get her hosed off. We got a little bit of some chip build up. I don't know. Time. You're buying time with this thing. Three hours to cut and split all that, and somebody's gonna be technical about it, so let's just call it four for the time it took me to get the machine up here and get everything set up. You wanna call it four hours, that's fine. That's half a day doing something in the rain that I wouldn't be doing today anyway because all my other projects are rained out. Time. It's pretty slick. Give Clint and those guys a call up there, CC Equipment. I'll put a link in the description and check out his YouTube channel, by the way. Clint said he's got some Super Duty stuff up there for me too that I can snag to help with the dump truck project. So we may be doing that soon as well. But the next video, back on the YouTube yacht, which is somewhere behind me in that general direction. We're gonna start framing. Weather looks pretty decent for it next week. Material's supposed to arrive on Monday. That always goes to plan. And I'm excited for it. I can't thank you guys enough for watching. And I hope I get to see you on the next one.